when you grow up in a home with like some level of emotional chaos that you want to understand human behavior from this standpoint of like, if you understand it, you have more control over it. I've never lived through their circumstances. It's not fair for me to say that they should have done better. One of the biggest contributing factors to recidivism is lack of access to mental health care. Justice is rehabilitation. Welcome to The Human Experience. I'm Jennifer Peterkin, and this is episode 12, Allie's Story. Allie grew up in a pretty sheltered environment. Now she works with a really vulnerable population in the heart of Pittsburgh. I've known Allie for a long time. She's like a little sister. I'm so proud of her for what she's doing, yes, but also for who she is. Allie has an incredibly special ability to see different people's points of view. It doesn't necessarily inform her opinion, but it does inform her empathy. And that is one of the many things that makes her a great social worker and a great friend. Allie works as the program supervisor for a nonprofit organization called People's Oakland, a wellness center for those battling chronic, severe mental illness. The mission of People's Oakland and the comprehensiveness of the programs that they offer are quite beautiful. If you'd like to learn more about People's Oakland or find out how you can support them, please visit the show notes for more information. I don't know. The conversation's always, it'll go, it'll go where it goes. Who knows? Anything could happen. Okay. I mean, Allie, I've known you for, gosh, like 20 years at least, more than that, which is crazy. I can't believe we're that old. Yeah. That reminds me that I'm 32. I was like, that can't be. Oh, that is right. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So I've obviously seen you growing up and, you know, it's really fun to watch somebody that you've grown up with just as they evolve in their life and they grow and they become the person that they were meant to be. So you're now in Pittsburgh And you are a licensed social worker, correct? Yes. I got my licensed clinical social work license back in July of this year, which was a great thing to have done. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Like check that box off. Mm -hmm. So what, why social work? What got you into social work? I don't think I would have been in social work if it wasn't for my undergraduate internship, which was at People's Oakland, which is where I'm currently the program supervisor. Yeah, I had no interest whatsoever going into going into working with chronic, severe mental illness. I wanted to be like a private practice therapist one day. I think my upbringing pushed me to a psychology bachelor's track, right? Like I was like, mm-hmm. I want to understand human behavior. I think it's really common when you grow up in a home with like some level of emotional chaos that you want to understand human behavior from this standpoint of like, if you understand it, you have more control over it. And it's like a way of creating safety. And that's probably true for everybody who's ever gotten their bachelor's degree in psychology. (laughs) They're like, what is up with people? I need to figure this out. (laughs) Um, So that was why I went to you know, that was why I like went into college and I was like, I know I want to do something with psychology because I want to have a better understanding of this. And then after I started, I remember specifically being very disappointed when I got my internship because I, I really didn't want to do it. And then after the first week, I was like, this is awesome. Oh, like, wow. I loved it so much, much to my surprise. And I don't remember why I was hesitant for it. I think I thought maybe it would be too overwhelming. I mean, I'd never done any kind of counseling at all. Mm -hmm. And my undergrad internship was not counseling. My undergrad internship was like hang out with people in our drop-in center and get to know them and learn what it's actually looks like to live with mental illness versus what like media may have told you it's like to live with mental Mm -hmm. illness. And, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I loved it. And then I never left. They luckily, when I graduated, they had a few openings in, the counseling department. There's really, it's a, that's a weird way to say it. We really only have one department. It's (laughs) It's counseling. It's not that it's a 10 person organization. (laughs) We all do everything, but it was called like, you know, a counselor position opened up and I was offered that in May of 2013. And then I've been there ever since. Wow. It's been almost 10 years. Yeah. That's crazy. It is. It's crazy how quickly that has gone by. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never a dull day. I have to, <laughs> I have to tell you. <laughs> so explain what the function of People's Oakland is. So People's Oakland is a unique organization in that it would be hard to find a organization that replicates our model exactly. So we are entirely staffed or almost entirely staffed by master's level counselors. And we provide blended social rehabilitation with mental health counseling. So the social rehabilitation aspect, we have a social center or drop-in center downstairs. It's a four-floor facility, if I can give a visual. There's also a virtual tour on our website, www.peoplesoakland.org. So okay. yeah, <laughs> you can always check there, it man. out. So we offer social activities for people to do together. There's a pool table. There's ping pong table. There's ample arts and crafts supplies and counselors will always be in the drop-in center whenever it's open. And as members kind of hang out, get to know each other, engage, it creates a lot of opportunities for some social coaching, especially around, you know, topics that are not necessarily appropriate to bring up in a drop-in center or if their tone is coming across more aggressively than they realize, or if they're having a hard time asserting themselves. That'll happen a lot too. You have someone who feels uncomfortable, looks uncomfortable, you know they're uncomfortable, and they're like, they will sit there all day unless we assist them in being like, hey, like I don't want to have that conversation with you anymore. Yeah. So it creates a great opportunity to get, you know, the behavioral coaching. And then all of that is done in conjunction with individual and group counseling. So we have a recovery group every morning that everyone is invited to. And it's basically a peer support group, like come and share what you're going through today and what are some things that your peers can offer you as like a way of support. And then we'll do different, different topic groups like DBT, CBT skills, things that help with symptom management. Because when you're dealing with severe mental illness, you're usually dealing with active symptoms that come up, maybe not all the time, but they will come up again. They will never be gone, but you will continue to gain mastery over them mm -hmm. so that it's less disruptive. Yeah. That's incredible. It seems so comprehensive. And yeah, I've never heard of a organization like that before. How does the area kind of respond to your presence? Do you mean like the community or do you mean? That's the word okay. I was looking for. <laughs> How does the community respond so, to your presence? The community doesn't know that we're there. Like our neighbors will oftentimes have people be like, I've lived up the street for 50 years and I never knew what this building was. I never noticed the building. I lived in Oakland for four years and until I had a reason to be in it, I was like, oh, I've never noticed this huge <laughs> building like in the middle of this neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that there's not, I mean, I haven't, I don't have like a direct like community response to it. I will say our location is ideal because we have a lot, it's in Oakland, which is right by the universities. And we have a great intersection of students, right? We have probably 15 interns a year come through and do, and for vi various departments, psychology, social work, occupational therapy, pharmacy, you know, we run the gamut on interns. We also run on interns. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great. It's a convenient location for them. Mm -hmm. There's also ample Section 8 and supportive housing available in the Oakland area. So a lot of our members can walk to their to their home away from home. I mean, that's what it becomes for them. It's like their community where they go to feel a sense of belonging. Yeah. And it's great that they can walk there. And then a lot of them received treatment through Western Psychiatric Hospital, which is also in Oakland, right up the street. Oh, perfect. So everything is walkable, which is great. I think that maybe maybe that's better, right? That there isn't a community response. Like it, it means that you guys are doing your job to kind of destigmatize things. Like that's not known as the whatever, some derogatory term where like people that are not accepted by society go, it's just kind of like it exists, but you fly under the radar a little bit. Yeah. I think that's a good point. We've never had a complaint. It's never been like, I don't want this organization in my community. If anything, the response is overwhelmingly positive when people realize what we're doing. They're like, oh, that is so important. We're so glad you're doing that work. But I would say the Pittsburgh community is generally really nice. So That's great. We've got that Midwestern vibe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, right? You're almost there. <laughs> almost there. So 
you said you had no prior interest in working with people with severe mental illness. What do you think changed that? I mean, obviously you were working with them, so mm-hmm. that direct contact, but did you have a moment or, or a series of moments where you were like, this is just something that I want to be involved in long term? Yeah, I think it was really, I felt such peace being there. I felt such a sense of belonging. And it's interesting because I see this with our interns all the time. There's people who are like, they are going to go into chronic severe MI. Like that's going to be their population. And they should come to our building and they're like excited by the work. They're interested. They're motivated. They're comfortable. They are creating that space for our members to feel at home. And they are just naturally you know, loving it. And then there's people who are going to be great clinicians that will be like, I actually don't see people with severe mental illness, (laughs) 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 which is common, which happens a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's also fine. And that's a great, I mean, it's an internship. It's a rule out experience for a lot of people. Like this isn't what I want to do forever. Counseling techniques are counseling techniques across the board. So you're not going to learn something that's not helpful. Like it can be applied no matter who you're working with a lot of the times. Yeah. At least in our setting, what you're doing, because they're not highly specialized in any kind of modality. You now are working closely with a local jail, right? Is it a jail or a prison? It's a jail. Okay. We are working with people who have been in jail. (laughs) Well, no, I mean you personally, like, so you are, you are kind of pivoting into a different, a different aspect of work you're with, which is volunteer at this point, but what is the connection there? Sure. I will walk through that story probably with a longer response than you are looking for, but I want to rewind yes. to your other question. Please about, rewind and do all the things. So I would identify what I was describing before as like Holy Spirit, woohoo on your, like, not woohoo. I wouldn't call it woohoo, but like, <laughs> like, like, I don't want to say confirmation because that sounds really serious, but it's just like this feeling you get in your gut where you're like, I'm pretty sure this is what God has for me. Mm-hmm. I think this is where God wants me to be. The first time I felt that ever was when I was visiting the university of Pittsburgh. And I was like, this is where I want to go to college. And I will be clear. I hated college. Like I did not have a good time Oh wow! <laughs> at all. <laughs> I was anxious. I had gone from, you know, a graduating class of 96 people, I think less than that actually, to a huge university. I had never had to make friends since I was 13. (laughs) It was a mess. And then I graduated and I was like, I love Pittsburgh. I do not like college. I'm someone who was bred for the nine to five life, Mm. which is convenient for me, isn't (laughs) it? (laughs) So yeah, so like that was the first time I felt that like Holy Spirit agreement of like, this is where you want to be. And then when I was at People's Oakland, I was like, well, this is what I want to do. And then I started getting bored after like four years Mm -hmm. because our organization is small. And at the time there was not really a path of what's the word I'm like, like promotion or like, I was never going to do anything other than what I was doing except for like, if people left and there was no intention at the time of that happening. Um, And so I was praying through, I was also going through a very, I would call it charismatic phase of my faith, as many of us do. Not that, I mean, not to be disrespectful, that's just not how I relate to God Mm -hmm. naturally. I think it's great for people who do, but I felt really jealous of people who were like, God speaks to me through visions. And I was like, I don't want that. (laughs) And so I was praying and I was praying to be like, what, what do I do from here? I can't stay at People's Oakland forever. Or so I thought. What was my <laughs> what is my next move gonna be? And then this is like the only time that this has happened for me. That as I was praying that the Allegheny County jail popped into my head. And I was like, that's weird and a little foreboding because you know, I was like, why is the jail in my future? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. That's, I, know. I don't know how to take that. <laughs> I was like, I really hope it's from a treatment standpoint. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of ignored that for a while. And then a few years later, or I guess like a year later, I went through the same cycle. Burnout is seasonal a lot in social work. Like you get to the point where you're like, I'm done with this. <laughs> What's my next move? That happened again the next year. And I was talking to a friend and she was like, well, maybe you just want to work with a different like population or setting. Maybe you would want to work with people who are incarcerated out of the blue. She suggests that. I was like, I do want to do that. So I finally follow up on this little Holy Spirit inkling, right? Like go, go into the jail. And there's this organization, wonderful organization called Foundations of Hope, which provides curriculum in one of the pods on the jail. It's a 
interfaith effort. So I haven't like looked at their website recently to know their language, but they're inviting anyone from a faith community to come in and provide support to individuals who are incarcerated. I will just claim here, I don't think this is a recent change. We're not supposed to say inmates anymore, and I'm still getting into that habit. So if I say it, just flag me and I'll apologize again. Okay. So- <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not I I'm not as well versed in the lingo, in the appropriate language. So if you did say it, I actually didn't even notice. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I've said it yet, but it could happen. Just okay. so, sorry in advance. I'm working on it. So yeah. All right. So, so they're providing curriculum in the jail and I started volunteering to provide a, essentially it was like a CBT curriculum or at least related to that. It was looking at criminal and addictive thought patterns and how we can change them so that we can identify like the ways the ways that our thinking is leading us to justify or rationalize behavior that ends lends us to being in jail. So I taught that class for a while and then I was in the process of getting my LCSW. So I needed more hours and I also needed a supervisor. And the woman at the time who was the director of the pre-release program, which was the program I was a part of, suggested a friend of hers who was an LCSW providing supervision and also is like, do you want to provide individual counseling to the guys on the pod on the weekend? Like you could come in. And so I did that. I did that for almost two years. I would go in on a Sunday and I would meet with like six, six or so people. We would only do 30 minutes at a time. And then I would receive supervision for that. So that helped me get my LCSW. It also gave me much more insight into what types of mental health struggles people in jail were having. And I was like, this is really familiar. Mm. (laughs) I like this is sometimes people would be explaining to me their life story. And I would be thinking like, do you know that you have bipolar disorder? And they didn't. (laughs) And I wouldn't tell them that wouldn't be the appropriate (laughs) context. (laughs) But it happened a lot where I was like, okay, so we're seeing a lot of overlap in the mental health concerns people are having in jail and the mental health concerns we're addressing at People's Oakland. Mm. And that sparked the idea of like, we should have a reentry program at People's Oakland. We should help people get connected to treatment right away. And I think People's Oakland is ideal for this for a couple reasons. One, a lot of times when I was talking with the gentlemen who were incarcerated, they would express this idea of like, when I get out, I'll have to go back to the same community. And this community is one that is only going to encourage me to return to whatever whatever I was doing that was getting me in trouble in the first place. And People's Oakland is an alternative to that. Like it is a community that you can go and find a sense of belonging. And you're all working together towards, we have these core values of hope, integrity, respect, empathy, and humility. And that's something that our members do a great job reinforcing. So like whenever you are there, you are being encouraged to live holistically, to love yourself, to love others. It's just a good alternate to a community that's like maybe not encouraging you to make the best decisions for you. Sure. That was one reason. Two, one of the biggest contributing factors to recidivism is lack of access to mental health care. And we don't bail yet. So there's no wait. Like you can just, you can just come immediately. We did have to revise a policy. Formerly, we said you have to be in treatment to be a part of People's Oakland. And for our, we call it the Bridging the Gap program now. For our Bridging the Gap program, you have to be willing and working towards seeking treatment. And we hired a resource coordinator to assist the, you know, individuals with that. So once they come to our Once they come to our building, a lot of them are coming with a treatment team already because they came through JRS, Justice Related Services, is like the mental health coordination unit that works with the jail. We get a lot of referrals from them. So they've already coordinated their care. And this is just like a good place for them to spend time, which is great. But for people who don't, for people who are coming in and they haven't been hooked up with a primary care physician, a psychiatrist, a therapist, we are going to work with them to get connected to all of those services But we're not going to tell them they can't use our services in the interim because we have all these master's level counselors hanging out (laughs) ready to provide you some therapy in the meantime until you get, you know, until you get more primary care. So that was another reason that I thought this would be a good, it was a good way to meet a need that the community had. It's incredible. It seems so obvious, but it wasn't being done. So... I just, I think that a lot of us don't understand the 
the system and how it fails people with mental illness, especially chronic severe mental illness, I'm assuming, Mm -hmm. you know, and this is not my area of expertise, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that there is just kind of no place for these people to land. And unfortunately, they end up in jail or they end up on the street. And so having programs in place that actually from a public health standpoint that says, you know, we understand that you need support and resources in order to be a successful. It's just so important. And mm-hmm. there's, there's not enough of that out there. Yes, there is not enough of that out there. <laughs> She's uh, like, say more obvious things. <laughs> no, I'm. you reminded me of the fact that in PA state legislation right now, they have $100 million allocated for mental health that's just going to sit there because they can't agree on how to spend it. And oh I was like, I'm just mad about that. Uh, <laughs> As you should we be. Need, we need that money. So you have actually pushed further into the jail system in Allegheny County, correct? And you have more involvement with the jail? So I don't have direct involvement with jail staff. The ways that I'm involved with the jail are through forming partnerships with programs in the jail, like JRS and Foundations of Hope, for so that they know to refer people to us. Like when they're getting out, we are a resource for the individuals that they're working with. So the other way that I'm involved with this is that I co-convene an advocacy group called the Corrections Collective, which was started after a conference in, I think, 2019, provided by CSPS. I should really look this up and know. (laughs) (laughs) No worries. I feel bad. I'll get back to you on that information. But so they had this conference on the impact of mental health and the system gaps that are leading individuals with mental illness to be incarcerated. So one of the historical stories here is that in the 70s, we deinstitutionalized, right? So we had people who were had spent their entire lives in institutions, mm-hmm. and we were like, that's not effective. They'll thrive in their community, which was true. And then we sent them all into the community with very little supports in place. And so we were just like, oh, we need to figure this out. And that is actually when People's Oakland was formed. It was in response to that crisis of all of a sudden there's all these people with severe mental illness living in the community very – unsupported and not really sure of how to get their needs met. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was how people's Oakland started big picture macro level issue. A lot more people with mental illness are now just in jail, right? So they might not be in an institution treating their mental health, but they're in an institution Mm. and that's, you know, they call that like the revolving door of mental illness and incarceration. And it's just, it's something that I don't know that we found a solution for it yet. But one of the things that would be helpful is to have more organizations that are providing treatment and care to especially like substance use disorder. Okay. We need way more addictions, treatment options for people who are being incarcerated because they have a substance use disorder. Incarceration is not going to help you with your substance use disorder. <laughs> yeah. And same thing with like individuals who are struggling with mental illness. They also need more treatment options available to them. So like alternative alternative placements would be great. And we do have those in Allegheny County. We also have a lot of people who are incarcerated in Allegheny County. And it's part of the effort right now is to look at like how can we reduce the numbers of people who are going through jail. And one way that you can do that is to increase alternative options. So anyway, with the Corrections Collective that I co-convene, we are working to advocate for solutions that we try to identify through community collaboration. So one of my passions would be to see way more collaboration between community-based organizations and the Allegheny County Jail. I think it would be very helpful for individuals to have contact with their future treatment providers before they are released. They've never been in treatment before. They do not know these organizations. They can look at all the information online that they want to. They're probably not going to go if they don't know you. There's also a lot of stigma in treatment and having someone interact with you and show you like we will be supportive of you not stigmatizing of you or dehumanizing of you like this will be you know a working relationship that you would enjoy is going to help them actually utilize the services that are available to them so i'm hoping to see an increase in you know community-based service provision within the jail also 
the jail can't be everything, right? We can't have our jail be a hospital and a treatment center and all these things. We need these partnerships for it to not just be a really bad experience that leads to trauma and <laughs> more behavioral issues. Exactly. Yes. So, Man, I just, I think that's so fantastic. What pops into my head is, you know, there's more conversations now about public health and mental illness and substance abuse being a public health issue and not a criminal issue or a justice issue, right? Well, a department of justice issue. So as somebody who has very intimate and firsthand experience working with this population, what is the balance here between people need to be held accountable as, as much as they are capable of being held accountable. And also the government and community organizations need to understand that they need certain levels of support that other people may not need. Mm -hmm. So the word that comes to mind is like, what is just, right? Like what is justice? And in my experience, and a lot of this has filtered through my belief in God and well, I think the Bible says, <laughs> like, just me. I think, I think justice is rehabilitation, mm. right? Like why, and why shouldn't it be? People are, a, a whole host of factors lead people to commit crime, to engage in risky behavior, to do things that society says, no, no, you can't do that. That's not okay. And not that, in there, and it's not okay. <laughs> like, I agree with that. But people don't start from, and even playing ground. I mean, your where you are born, your socioeconomic status, your gender, your race, these factors have such influence over what you end up doing. And I think people don't like to acknowledge how much their behavior is influenced by outside factors, but it is. And <laughs> and we and we have to work with people to be able to have the same opportunities that we have to make better choices. Mm. You know, it's much easier for me to live within the constraints of what society says I have to live within because of my privilege, because I have, you know, I have parents who are willing to support me financially if a crisis arises, right? I have a full-time job. I have a house. I have a car. I have all of these things that make life so much easier and reduce the amount of stress that I'm under on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think we just have to consider that when we look at talking about justice and accountability. Mm. Like yeah. how, how can you argue that someone needs to be accountable in circumstances that you've never lived through and are, you're not doing anything to promote that they would be in better circumstances? Sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you kind of acknowledged this earlier too, where when you were talking about offering counseling within the jail individually you kind of made an offhand comment of like, do you know you have bipolar? And like, did, has anybody ever told you that? And I think that is maybe a really important factor too. Like there are, there's a lot of misinformation and a lack of education about mental wellness. And that also I feel like is very predicated on the environment in which you grow up is mental illness even talked about? Is it something that you're able to seek treatment for? Like there are people that still say that mental illness isn't a thing or it's not serious or, you know, was that something that you had access to get treatment for? Yes. Access is one thing. Like, did you have access to it too? Did your life make you willing to engage with it? Like all the circumstances that have brought you to this point, did any of them encourage you to seek professional mental health care? Mm. Because there's a lot of stigma out there. And there's also people have bad experiences with mental health care. People have experiences where their culture is not respected, where their circumstances are not appropriately like filtered through a lens of their lived experience. You know, I was having a conversation recently with someone who is a really strong Christian and she went to a Christian counseling organization and shared openly. She was like, my experience was just not good. And she, she was saying, I don't think they understood where I was coming from as a black woman, like what I was bringing to the table. I think we have a lot of work to do when it comes to providing healthcare across communities. I think there's a reason that certain demographics are not willing to engage with mental health care. Mm. Those things need to be addressed and we need to work towards just doing better. Yeah. Yeah. 
Apparently, like, when does at what point in the interview do I stop feeling nervous? <laughs> when is that oh, you're so in? nervous. <laughs> don't be nervous. I feel like I don't have the right words. You're doing um, great. You're doing fantastic, and I don't have thanks. the right words. Please, are you kidding? I couldn't think of the word community, so yeah. just take heart, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing that we've touched on a little bit that has definitely shaped the way that I think about all of these things is my own experience growing up in a very conservative upper middle class household. Uh, you know, much love for mom and dad. <laughs> like the, I mean, very different experience than now having worked ten years in the field of providing mental health treatment to people who are in poverty, who are suffering from chronic disease, who are suffering from mental illness. There's a lot more chronic-related health diseases for people who are in poverty that we deal with a lot at People's Oakland. We're seeing it all the time. Type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure are probably the two main ones Mm. that you're going to see. So anyway, my point is there was so much that I didn't know because I had never been exposed to it. Mm. And when you've lived through that, it's really, really humbling. (laughs) And it makes it so much easier to not get mad at people who don't know what I know because they have also not been exposed to it. And I think generally people struggle with that. (laughs) We have expectations of they should have changed by now. They should make themselves aware of this. We tell ourselves if I was in their environment, I would be different than them. And come on, you don't know that. So yeah, so I think that is like the perspective that I try to filter a lot of my opinions through, like people who are incarcerated. I've never lived through their circumstances. It's not fair for me to say that they should have done better. Mm. Like they, they did, they're doing the best they can. We need to help them do better if we want them to do better. Yeah, absolutely. And that's also, I'm sorry, that's just addressing people who are incarcerated and should be. Not even, let's not even get into how many people are incarcerated for no reason. (laughs) Absolutely. That is such a good point too. And it's, it's hard to change. It's hard to grow in something that like you're saying, there's no exposure to. It takes a lot of effort and it's not something that everybody is willing or even knows how to do. So that's a really interesting perspective that you bring to the table. Like I used to be this, I'm now this, but I understand where I was. And therefore I understand how that community still thinks Mm -hmm. and how they don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And how, even if you do, even if you become aware of a different perspective, if your environment is not one that is embracing that perspective, Mm -hmm. it is hard to hold it. And I think that is a human experience we can all relate to. Like your environment just really does shape your views. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to have autonomy of thought, Mm -hmm. but don't let the pride you have for your autonomy of thought justify you judging somebody else for not living up to your standards Mm -hmm. that you think you're living up to. (laughs) And there it is. (laughs) It's a humbling perspective. And I think humility enables the reaching across the aisle and the bridging the gaps. And it's hard to, to stay in that place. It's hard not to get angry over things that you know are wrong or that you have lived through or seen people live through. And you're like, I just don't understand why people don't get this, but taking that step back is super important. And I think about, we had this conversation a year and a half ago, right? We, f- we first did this a year and a half ago. We talked through all the same things. Mm-hmm. How much have I changed in that time? Like there are things I probably said a year and a half ago that I don't agree with anymore. <laughs> <laughs> People change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're bad at that. We love to, we love to go 10 years ago, this person, they said this, and now they're saying something different. That's a good thing. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> we want people to change and grow as they filter their understanding of life through experience. That is a healthy process. I think that also can help reduce the amount of anger we have for people mm, yeah. <laughs> who aren't thinking like us at that moment. Yeah, sure. Yeah. If you look back at yourself in five years and you're the exact same person, then there's pro- that's probably a problem. Mm-hmm. So just a little PSA. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you have really grown to love the area that you live in and work in, and it has become your community. It's wildly different from where you grew up because you're in a city and you're in an urban setting here and you grew up in the suburbs, upper middle class, you know, all of the bells and whistles that come with that. So what was the process of kind of integrating yourself into a different setting and what made you stay? Work made me stay. Yeah, I planned if I hadn't gotten the job at People's Oakland, I had this fantasy that I was going to go live in Washington D.C. and like work with individuals who were experiencing homelessness there. I don't think I would have been great at that. Why Washington D.C.? I had a, like a great time partying in Washington D.C. throughout my <laughs> college years, <laughs> and I was like, let's do this more. Yeah, I just had I had a, I had friends that I thought were that I think still are super cool <laughs> that live in DC. Okay, and I was like, I think it would be great to be a part of this all the time. It's not what God had for me, and that's fine because my life has turned out to be pretty great. But yeah, work kept me here. After a year of working with everybody else who already had their master's degree, mostly in social work, I decided I needed to get my master's degree in social work. And I am glad I did because the, the I guess the options when you're thinking about counseling, like social work is one of them. And then there's more clinical counseling tracks that you can do. And what I love about social work is that it goes in less depth clinically, but it covers a broader range of what the humans you'll be working with may need in Mm -hmm. terms of like service coordination, advocacy, all of these different things that are more of like a holistic care versus, I mean, I, I will never have the skill or depth of someone who is really doing like the clinical individual, you know, direct counseling. Sure. And I I get bored talking to people. So to be honest, (laughs) I can do it. I mean, I can do it a lot more probably than other people, (laughs) but after a while, I'm like, I want to do something else. Yeah. So this is a really good fit. Yeah. It was a good fit for me. And then I lived in Pittsburgh apartments from 2012 to 2016. And that was a wild four years because and you you can feel free to steal this idea and produce it, but like Pittsburgh slumlords could be a real, oh, <laughs> a wow. real reality show. The last apartment I lived in, the bathroom in the apartment above mine would pour into my bedroom, and when maintenance came to fix it, they used my bath towels to soak up the water <gasps> and then left them in my tub and never fixed it. So my dad was like. And I was like 26 and I was like, I can't, I have to pay my rent here. Like I'm in under contract. And my dad was like, we're leaving (laughs) and we're not going to pay them any more money. (laughs) And so he very generously helped me purchase this home, which is in Highland Park. And I love Highland Park. Highland Park is a great neighborhood to live in. It's, I mean, it's gorgeous for one. It's by the zoo. If you like the zoo, (laughs) it's by the rest of the city. So yeah, it's great. Yeah. And I appreciate, I appreciate the diversity of thought here. And I get that diversity. I mean, Pittsburgh is blue. It's not purple. It's not red. It's blue. But if you go to church, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to find a vastly different mindset than when you're at work, mm-hmm. <laughs> working in social work. So I, I've really enjoyed being exposed to the gamut. Yeah. A little bit when it comes to not just political thinking, but also our understanding of life. Yeah, absolutely. I I just think that's something that you specifically do really well is you're so open to what anybody like you, you don't let people get away with saying hateful or bigoted things, but you're so open to where people are and meeting them exactly where they are and just being genuinely okay with them Mm -hmm. as people, which I think is a really important skill set that many people don't have because Mm -hmm. it's a really difficult skill set to hone, mostly because you don't actually meet that many people that think differently than you. Mm -hmm. So you're also in a unique situation that you are kind of immersed in so many different areas Mm -hmm. that you do get those perspectives. Yeah. And I think always, always remembering the way I used to think, you know, the things I didn't know and how much exposure just changes your everything. I think one of the challenging things is like, this is my approach and my perspective. And so I'm not saying like, this is how everybody should live, 
But I try to think about, I try to empathize in that way. And I try to bring that into my approach to advocacy, my approach to my work, you know, interacting with other individuals. And it would be very hypocritical of me having that posture to not then try to empathize with people who are mad and are like, and you should say it. And for some people, they should. I mean, their experiences are intolerable. Mm. And it's not fair for me to ask them to say it nicely anymore. (laughs) And I'm not asking them to say it nicely anymore. My experiences have been taller. I think I'm accountable to saying it nice and trying to bring about change with the level of grace that I have been shown. Mm. So like my approach is going to be a lot different than someone else who's had a different lived experience. Yeah. You know, absolutely. You and your husband both did this where I think you kind of answered the question before I even ask it to you, but through the lens of your experience, what does compassion mean to you? It means accepting that I don't know what this person has lived through that makes them the way they are. Mm. And that if I take the time to get to know that, I will probably understand where they're coming from a lot more. Yeah. I mean, I hope that this is what this podcast kind of becomes too as well, because that I totally agree. That is, I think, the height of compassion. So that's beautiful. What are you hoping for? What are you hoping to see in the future? I'm hoping to see a shift in the way we do social change. (laughs) Dream big, right? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) hundred percent. Yeah. So like I, and this is one of those areas where I'm very aware in five years, I might be really different about this because I'm at this point where I'm like, I'm just getting into advocacy and I'm like, let's work together guys. (laughs) And I'm going to stand by that until I'm sure one day I'm going to be ready to flip tables too. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But right now I'm just getting started and let's work together. That's, that's awesome. I'm so proud of you. I think what you're doing is incredible and I can't wait to hear more as you and maybe we'll come back in five years and say, How's, how are those I dreams? Know. Do you, do you I'll feel be a the radical same? radical abolitionist. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It'll be a fabulous interview. So well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to The Human Experience. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share it with others, and leave a rating and review on your favorite platform. Everyone has a story and I'd love to hear yours. So be sure to check out the show notes for more information about how to stay in touch. Do good and take care.